What's up, y'all? Today we are talking all about blossom end rot, specifically tomato blossom end rot. Yay! <laughs> so look, I totally get that necrotic rot and cell death on the fruits that we worked so hard to grow all year is potentially not the loveliest topic in gardening, but I think if you stick around you're gonna find that it is a surprisingly interesting and dynamic topic. And my goal with today's video is to both address some outdated information as well as provide you with enough knowledge on sort of the causes and cures of tomato blossom and rot to put together an effective practical plan based on the real world conditions in your garden. And maybe reassure you a little bit that if you are dealing with tomato blossom and rot that it's probably not the end of the world you're probably still going to get a good harvest and it might not even really be your fault or maybe i'm just trying to reassure myself because i've been away from the garden for a couple weeks now and when i got back things were looking really rough including quite a few little tomato fruits that are developing these nasty little lesions in them so let's go ahead and get into the tomato blossom and rot talk which i will henceforth refer to in the rest of this video as burr let's do it Okay, it would be really easy to walk into your garden and see these sort of pools of rotting necrotic black flesh on your precious tomatoes you've worked so hard for and assume that you have a terrible bacterial infection that is surely soon to spread to the rest of your plants, right? Or maybe a virus spread on the wings of those pesky pests you've been noticing or even a fungal infection caused by microscopic little spores spreading after a recent rain. Totally reasonable conclusions, but in this case, not actually. Correct. See, uh, burr is not a communicable disease like a bacterial infection or a virus, and in fact it is not going to spread from one plant to another, although sometimes it might seem like it's doing just that. And in fact it's not even tomato specific. It can impact other plants in the nightshade family, like your peppers or your eggplants, and even plants in the cucurbit family. It is possible to see it on squashes. Blossom end rot is a physiological disorder typified by these sort of pools of rotting black necrotic flesh that form on the bottom or the blossom end of young tomatoes as they are forming and these lesions right here are caused by the cell walls in the young tomato as it's forming weakening and then starting to fail and then eventually dying and then all of the fluids that were in those cells pooling out into that extracellular space creating this rotten pool that we see right here gross and kind of cool. Blossom end rot is often talked about as a calcium disease, and certainly there's some merit to that. See, for a long time it was observed that blossom end rot was caused by too little calcium available in the soil, and subsequently too little calcium in the uh, growing plant and those still young forming fruits. We were able to verify that fruits impacted by blossom end rot were lower in calcium than healthy fruits. But it turns out that was not the full story. And this is probably a pretty good time to pull up the research so we can look through it together. Later on, it was noted by researchers and commercial growers that, hey, even plants with plenty of available soil, calcium form these lesions, and the understanding evolved to be more about the plant's ability to uptake calcium, often due to poor watering. That's this bit that I am uh, highlighting right here. And of course, there's a plethora of anecdotes from home gardeners who have successfully combated blossom and rot in their gardens by supplementing the soil with extra calcium. And some experiments have certainly provided credence to this idea that blossom end rot is a failure to absorb calcium, as some researchers seem to significantly reduce the incidence of blossom end rot, as you can see here by the part that I'm highlighting, with calcium fruit sprays, meaning directly spraying dissolved calcium mixtures onto the plants themselves. Okay, this is where for a long time I thought the story kind of ended, until I came home to these fruits with blossom end rot and decided, hey, I want to dive a little bit deeper, and it turns out that that hole does go a little bit deeper. Now confusingly, blossom end rot continues to be present even in plants where high levels of calcium are directly observable in the plant's actual tissues, which raises the question of course whether or not calcium really is even the driving factor at play here at all, and that's the bit that I'm highlighting on this paper. And in fact, that's exactly what this more recent review of all of the available studies concluded. These researchers found that low available calcium in the fruits was caused by the blossom end rot, not the other way around. Not that calcium was causing the blossom end rot, but that blossom end rot was causing low amounts of calcium. Fruits that were tracked through their development life cycle were found to actually have similar levels of calcium early on in that life cycle, regardless of whether or not they went on to develop blossom end rot. So 
does a low available calcium result in blossom end rot or does blossom end rot result in low available calcium? Well, it seems like current research is pointing towards the latter. And more importantly, the mechanisms of nutrient uptake in plants are quite complex and blossom end rot does not seem, at least to me, to be a fully understood disease at this point. But don't worry, even if it's no longer a matter of crushing eggshells in and around our plant's roots, that doesn't mean all is lost when it comes to actually combating and managing burr in our gardens. And I think that's what really matters, right? And that's because all of this research, particularly this last piece in the section that I'm highlighting right here, have helped us to understand that in order to avoid and treat blossom and rot, it really comes down to removing environmental stressors and avoiding massive growth spurts, particularly after slow periods of growth, and removing those early impacted fruit to allow the plant to focus on future healthier trellises. In this video, I'm not going to be recommending calcium chloride fruit sprays, even though I did mention that experiment that found them to be successful or at least partially successful. I'm just not sure it's actually a practical solution for most of us. It requires continually spraying the right formulation at the right concentration directly onto the young fruit itself before they even develop blossom and rot. And I just feel like it's hard for me to recommend that when I don't think it would actually be a good fit for my own garden, at least anytime soon. Actually, let me just quote the uh, University of New Hampshire's fact sheet on blossom end rot. It does a pretty good job of explaining my rationale here. Uh, some researchers have reported that the application of calcium sprays directly onto developing fruit can reduce incidence of burr, but many others have reported that they did not reduce burr and were labor intensive to apply, and in some cases reduced marketable yields. To be effective, they need to be applied directly onto the young fruits, not to foliage, before the development of burr symptoms and would need to be applied continuously through the fruit's development. So several commercial calcium products exist for this purpose and on-farm experimentation may be worthwhile, but at this point we don't have enough evidence to recommend their use in managing burr. So with all of that in mind, let's focus on how we can set the stage to beat burr both before and after our tomatoes go into the ground in our own home gardens. Hey, so videos about growing food like this one are interesting to you. Please consider maybe liking the video or even subscribing if you're really into it. it really helps me out. I definitely super appreciate it. All right, let's get back into the bird talk. A lot of our strategy today is really about babying our plants and setting them up to be treated just the way they want to be treated in order to minimize burr. Luckily, if that sounds like too much work, and it is kind of a lot of work, there are a couple ways we can sort of just short circuit the whole process. First off, you can try to avoid varieties that are more likely to develop burr in the first place. That's going to be any sort of pear or plum shaped variety and any paste type variety. So uh, San Marzano's and Roma's are thought of as being some of the most vulnerable. And I'll go ahead and link to an old article I found with a list of purported less vulnerable varieties. I will say as an anecdote, this year my San Marzanos are one of the few slicer type or paste type tomatoes that I'm growing that have not developed any burr at all. They're doing really, really well, despite the fact that they're growing right next to and in the exact same growing conditions as a bunch of plants that do have burr. Uh, let me show you what I mean real quick. And then on the flip side, I have a neighbor growing maybe 50 feet away that is growing a variety that is sometimes thought of as being less vulnerable and they are also struggling with burr, which is just to say that your success with the strategy might vary a little bit. So a second more concrete option then is to simply grow cherry tomatoes, which are very rarely impacted and they're super delicious, which I think makes about reason 372 why cherry tomatoes are the absolute best. Now let's go ahead and talk about how to prepare your plant's environment ahead of transplant day to minimize the eventual risks. Okay, so the first thing that you can think about is a healthy soil pH level and low salinity levels. Tomatoes like a moderately acidic medium to grow in and an imbalance either to the basic side or to the acidic side can cause burr. And similarly, very high salt contents like that found in my native clay soil right here can stress out the plant's roots and generate, again, burr. For me, it looks like next year I need to be even more aggressive about diluting our heavy, very basic, 
high salt content soil with lots more compost to bring those levels down and produce healthy, strong roots. Salinity is something that's not really talked about a lot in home gardening, but in this case, it's really quite important. And to add on to that, very heavy clay soil like this can really cause burr because it drowns the plant's roots in a lot of water and it can physically, mechanically inhibit that root growth from spreading out. Looser, loamier, beautiful soil, obviously, is a lot less likely to be problematic. All that said, even though native in-ground soil certainly has its challenges, or, or at least it does for me anyways, for a lot of gardeners, burr is actually mostly a container phenomenon and it doesn't happen nearly so much for their plants planted into the ground. That's particularly true if you're able to select a spot where the water isn't going to just run off so quickly that the plant's roots are left dry, and also where the water isn't going to pool and drown the plant, where the plant is going to receive enough sunlight and heat in early spring that it puts on sustainable growth, but it's not going to get totally scalded and destroyed in midsummer. Too little light, too little heat, or too much light and too much heat are definitely stressors that can lead to burr. If you are growing in a container though, like these plants right here are, a larger container with a higher capacity to retain moisture is likely to be a better bet. When you're thinking about mixing up some dirt for that container, make sure that you have significant quantities of both moisture retention ingredients, things like sphagnum peat moss or cocoa core, as well as drainage ingredients like perlite in order to keep the moisture even and consistent. In other words, a higher quality potting mix is less likely to result in burr. Finally, you can really try to dial in your seed starting timing as well as your transplant timing. See, when you get those plants into the ground and it's still a little bit too cold for those roots and the leaves, that foliage is not receiving quite enough light and heat, and then all of a sudden the weather turns and they start getting a lot of heat and a lot of light and they put on a lot of growth, well, that can be a really strong recipe for burr. And the flip side of planting when it's too late, when the weather is already very hot and bright, but the plant doesn't really have a real canopy yet to help protect it, help shade itself a little bit, well, you guessed it, that can also be a recipe for burr. All right, that's all great for planting out next year, but what can we do if our plants start exhibiting signs of burr this year? Once a fruit has started developing blossom end rot, there's unfortunately no way to reverse course in that specific fruit. But that doesn't mean there aren't ways that we can help that same plant avoid setting burr in future tomato trellises. The first thing you can try doing is to simply wait. It's actually really common for a plant to develop its first flush of fruit with lots of blossom end rot, and then as that plant matures, it simply disappears. Interestingly, this is one of the reasons that it's so difficult to determine whether those traditional remedies are actually effective. Many of those plants that receive a calcium infusion would have stopped producing fruits with burr anyways. Even better than doing absolutely nothing, go ahead and prune off any fruit that you notice are developing early signs of blossom end rot. That way the plant can focus its sugars and its nutrients into future healthier trellises. Now I've shown you a couple fruit from my garden that were really obviously impacted by burr, but let's go ahead and take a look in the garden to see if we can find any that are earlier in that process and are showing more subtle signs. When it comes to feeding, we want to avoid giving the plant too much nitrogen and forcing it into plant growth overdrive. That period of really unsustainable, fast growth is a major risk factor for burr. Instead, what we're gonna wanna try and do is maintain an even regular feeding schedule using an appropriate low nitrogen vegetable or even tomato specific fertilizer. And I made a video that's pretty in depth on all things tomato feeding if you need a reference on that. On the off chance, that your soil is actually low in calcium. Even though most soils really aren't, an organic fertilizer like this one is probably gonna contain a lot of bone meal in it, and therefore it's going to have enough calcium to bring your soil levels back up to something more than adequate. Finally, and most importantly, seriously, this is the big one. We wanna regularly water and consistently water to keep the soil moist, avoiding periods where the soil gets really dry and then the roots get really wet. Now this is often best achieved by regular, deep, slow watering, which is frankly quite a bit easier if you've got your tomatoes hooked up to some sort of automated irrigation system. The challenge is gonna be determining whether you are overwatering or underwatering. So keep a really close eye on your soil when you start to see signs of burr forming on your fruit. I was really surprised to find that my soil was drying out quite a bit faster than I expected it to, despite being pretty well irrigated with these little drip lines. 
mulch can also really help to prevent excess evaporation. On the flip side, if you live somewhere where your summer tomato garden is going to receive significant rainfall, A, I'm very jealous, it is burning hot here. Uh, B, you're gonna wanna make sure that your tomato garden has either really good drainage or a good runoff system. Significant bursts of water all at once like that are a really good way to induce burr. You know, this whole burr thing is really a partially understood issue with complex underlying causes. And I'm so certain that in a year we're gonna learn something new about it and I'm gonna wanna add something or remove something or change something from this video. But for now, I will at least link to a whole bunch of really good resources in the description if you'd like some further reading. And hey, let's try not to get too beat up about the whole burr thing. Tomatoes are prolific plants and hopefully in no time we will all be enjoying some delicious fresh tomatoes from the vine. And that is all I've got for you today. As always, I hope to see you on the next one and happy gardening.